You're watching FJTN, the Federal Judicial Television Network. Well, I had an interesting experience. I had never used a typewriter before when I came into this job, and so I actually had to learn how to use the typewriter. Being a part of Generation X, I think we're the first generation that has been exposed to computers and CDs and other technologies at an early age. Along with so many other baby boomers, I'm very career oriented, I'm very loyal to the organization that hired me, and I'm pretty much in for the long haul. Well, other generations are a little annoying because they have so much energy, and it's hard to keep up with them. <laughs> Hi, I'm Lori Murphy, and welcome to our program on generational differences in the courts. I'm sure most of you recognize the setting for our introduction as a drive-in movie theater, but at least one generation or members of one generation working in the courts today likely have never seen or been to a drive-in movie theater. In fact, they've never known a world without ATMs, microwaves, or personal computers. But technology is only one of many influences on each of us. And today, we're going to talk about many of those influences on each generation working in the courts. We'll talk about how they're unique and also how we can work better together. But before we get started, I want to let you know that you can fax us your questions at any time during the broadcast. And the number is 800-488-0397. To help us explore today's topic, we've invited Patty Carey to our studio. Patty is the founder and president of Workforce Strategies. She is also an independent consultant and a generational expert. She has worked in the training and human resource management fields for over 20 years. So welcome, Patty. Thanks for being here. Thanks, Lori. I'm glad to be here. And to give you a sense of where we're heading today with the program, we're first going to define what a generation is. And then we're going to talk about each generation's values and characteristics. We'll talk about the similarities and differences in their work styles and communication. And finally, we'll apply some strategies to work more effectively together. So Patty, since our first objective is to define what a generation is, can you tell us how generations are determined? Well, generations are determined by the, uh, by the entire body that's, that's born and living at the same time. Typically, we determine generations by their birth year. Mm -hmm. Researchers also incorporate things like their historical events, um, shared heroes, attitudes, music, fashion, and family structure into defining a generation. Okay. Research goes on to say that those factors help to shape our value system, and that's another way that we can define generations. Well, one, I know we want to explore a lot of, of how generations are defined, but you mentioned birth years specifically, so let's start there. Right. What are the birth years uh, for each of the four generations we have today in the courts? Well, the research varies a little bit, but for the most part, this is what we know. Traditionalists are born between 1922 and 1946. Baby boomers are born between 1946 and 1964. Generation X, or Xers sometimes we call them, are born between 1964 and 1980, and then millennials are born between 1980 and 2001. And yes, there's another generation called Generation Z, and they're born after 2001. It's 2002 forward. Okay. Now, I've heard some other terms for some of these generations, and I'm wondering how these generations got the labels you just gave them, and also if there are other ways we can describe them. Well, we call traditionalists traditionalists because of their traditional value system. Right. You may hear them called veterans. You may hear them mm -hmm. called the silent generation. Tom Brokaw calls them the greatest generation because of their loyalty, their dedication, and the sacrifices that they've made. Baby boomers get the name of baby boomers from one baby being born every 17 minutes for 19 years. Wow. Xers, or Generation X, comes from a Billy Idol song, and it relates to a mathematical equation where the X is unknown, mm -hmm. and that's because this generation is hard to define and is so different from any generation that's prior to it. Millennials sometimes are called the net generation because of their, their technology background. Sometimes you may hear them called Generation Y, just feeding off of Generation X. Mm -hmm. 
I personally prefer to call them millennials because my research says that this generation wants their own identity and they do not want to be considered Generation X squared. Well, in preparing for today's program, I did a little research of my own because I wanted to know what the court family looks like in terms of numbers in each generation. So using the birth years that you gave us, I, um, I did a little digging and I found out that over half, 51% of the court family, and this includes judges as well as court staff, are baby boomers. So 51%. 9% of the court family is made up of traditionalists. So if you look at that, 60% of the court family are the two oldest generations. And so only 40% are the two youngest generations. Uh, Xers represent about 38% and millennials are about 2%. And I guess based on the birth years you gave us, you can kind of mark it as 40 and older are 60% of the population and about, and about 40 or younger are, uh, are the youngest two generations. Mm -hmm. So does this kind of compare with your research? For the most part, it falls right in line with what we're seeing in the private sector. In the private sector, about 50% of the workplace is comprised of baby boomers. And that makes sense when you think about the fact that that's who has the, the largest group in the workplace right. today. And in the private sector, we're finding that less than 5% make up millennials. Okay. And in the private sector, between 10 and 15% of employees make up that are, are from the generation of the traditionalist. Okay. Well, and before we get much further, I, I want to talk about, you know, when we categorize employees, there's always the risk of stereotyping them. So can you talk a little bit about that challenge of putting them into a generational category but not stereotyping them? Sure. Well, I think it's important that we understand that our generation is just one way of defining ourselves. Mm -hmm. There are many other ways, too. Our gender, our race, ethnicity, education background, income level, okay religious background, geography, and that list goes on and on and on. So the focus here is to focus on the individual, mm -hmm. but I want us to develop an awareness of the generational filter as well. I certainly don't want to put people in a box, right. but I do know from my own experience and from what research tells us that there are some genuine differences in the generation, okay. and I think that when we understand these, gener these generational differences, we will be more effective working in the workplace. Okay. And I, want, I think it's important that we point out today that when we talk about data today, we're going to talk about trends and averages. We're going to look at a generation as a whole. Therefore, there may be some people who say, well, I really don't quite fit into that. And in fact, I find that myself. I feel like I transcend generations. For example, I was raised by traditionalist parents. Mm -hmm. Therefore, I find that I have a fair amount of values of a traditionalist. Right. I was born in 1960. So my birth year tells me that I am a baby boomer, right. and I have a lot of values of a boomer, and certainly my peers impacted that too, and the events that were going on during that time. But since I'm bumping right up next to the Generation Xers, I find that I have values of an Xer too. So I really feel that I transcend several generations. You talk about values, and so mm -hmm. I'm wondering how values are impacted or affected by the generation that you grow up in. Well. Our, our values and our beliefs really make us who we are, and in fact, they fuel our behavior. And there's research that says if you can understand someone's beliefs and values, you can almost predict their behavior. Hmm. In the American culture, too, we have learned that the decade in which we turn 10 years old is the decade that has impacted our value system more than any other decade. So what's going on in that decade, historical events, societal trends, even television programming and pop culture are influencing our value systems. And to really take a look at this further, let's look at today's, let's say, 12 or 13-year-old, someone who was born in 1991 or 1992. Well, according to this research, the, the year Y2K, the year 2000, is the, the start of the decade that's going to impact this generation's value system more than any other decade. So right now, what's going on in the world right, right now? Right now, what's going on in the world okay. right now? So let's think about what's going on right now. What, what is impacting them? Well, violence is everywhere for them. It's on TV, it's in the movies, it's in video games, it's, it's in their entertainment a lot. They're impacted also by a constant threat of terrorism. We're involved in the Iraqi war, the Freedom Campaign, so that's impacting their value systems. They're also impacted by music, and music today is more introspective. Retro clothing is huge. Mm -hmm. Reality TV is huge. Mm -hmm. And in some states, 
students are actually being held accountable for learning, which is different from other generations, by focused test. So this 12 or 13 year old, our hypothetical 12 or 13 year old, are you saying that the values and the things that are influencing them are shaping their values and that's going to impact how they are when they hit the workplace? Absolutely. It's hard to predict work attitudes. Okay. But again, when you look at this research, what it's telling us is that the things today are shaping the way this next generation is seeing the world. Right. And while these things have impacted all of us, these things are impacting their value systems in a huge way. So it's shaping the way that they see the world and it's shaping the way that they will eventually function in the world. And how they'll function at work. And then. how they'll function at work, absolutely. Well, since we won't have a chance to work with these 12 or 13 year olds for at least a few more years, I think it might be helpful to give everyone a chance to think about what was going on in their world during the decade in which they turned 10. So I'd like you at your site, you can do this by yourself or with a partner or with a group, but to think about the things that influenced you during the decade in which you turned 10. So list at least a couple of key historical events that you remember and a couple of television shows that you remember watching during that decade in which you turned 10. So take a few minutes and we'll come back and talk about it. Welcome back. I hope you enjoyed that trip down memory lane. I had the opportunity to ask some court staff these same questions earlier. And before I ask Patty to comment, let's hear what they had to say about the historical events and the TV shows that they were paying atten attention to in the decade that they turned 10. Well, I turned 10 in 91, and that was right around the Gulf War. <laughs> and so we did a lot of that. We watched it on television at school and everything. Um, I vividly remember the explosion of the Challenger in 1986. The Space Shuttle Challenger disaster. 
when the teacher was on board the space shuttle. I was in math class. Mm -hmm. The 1989 Tiananmen Square student uprising. I was nine years old when we first went into Kuwait to expel Iraq. And I vividly remember my dad coming in and saying to turn on the news because that we had just invaded Iraq. I remember uh, when Reagan's assassination attempt occurred and most profoundly was Ali North's trial. That was a uh, kind of eye-opening. I remember the I like Ike signs and everything about President Kennedy and how he was running for election and remnants of the Korean War. My favorite uh, TV show was The Brady Bunch. When I was growing up, my favorite TV show was Lost in Space and as I got older, The Love Boat. The wonderful world of Disney with all the fireworks. I was the child that just got a color TV, so that was the most beautiful program of all. Um, Full House was probably one of the best ones. Um, Facts of Life and Family Ties. When I was about six years old, I remember laying on the floor in front of the radio, listening to The Shadow. I loved to watch Full House and Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. Well, when I was really young, I liked um, the Smurfs and Dennis the Menace. <laughs> a hop along Cassidy, uh, Gene Autry, and so on, and I believe that was in black and white television. <laughs> well, maybe some of the things you just heard showed up on the list that you made for yourself. And, you know, Patty, when we looked at, when we were listening to this, I, I thought, I can understand why historical events are Im important to shape our perspectives and our values, but why is it important to care about what we watched on TV? Well, I think we can learn a lot by thinking about the radio and television programming and the changes that have occurred, but in fact, it's more than that. When traditionalists and boomers watched TV or listened to a radio program, for the most part, they did that as a family unit. So there was direct parental supervision, whereas when an Xer or a millennial watches TV, they tend to watch it alone, or growing up, they tended to watch shows alone, so there was little direct or sometimes no parental supervision. Also, the programming content has changed dramatically. I mean, think about what's on prime time today versus then what was on prime time 20 or 30 years ago. Right. Well, I know we're, we're curious to find out a little bit more about each of these generations. So let's start with the traditionalists. Okay. And can you tell us what shaped this generation and affected their values? Well, the key historical events that shaped this generation include the years after the Great Depression, World War II, and specifically Pearl Harbor. For many members of this generation, December the 7th, 1941, had a huge impact on them. They can remember where they were when they heard the news of the Japanese bombings. And they were also impacted by the Korean War. In addition, the extended family had a huge impact on their value systems. This generation, for the most part, grew up close to their relatives. So their grandparents, aunts and uncles, and cousins were part sometimes of their er everyday life. Right. So in a time of economic or emotional need, they would often look to the extended family for support. Mm -hmm. This generation also listen to the radio. They didn't have TV, right. certainly not like we do today. Right. <laughs> and as we just heard, someone listened to the shadow. Well, interesting, this generation developed good listening skills and strong imaginations. When she listened to the shadow, she was there. Not only was she hearing the story, she was living that story. She was tasting whatever they were eating and she was just right there with them. So they developed strong imaginations. Right. Can you tell us some other values and characteristics of the traditionalist generation? Well, traditionalists tend to be conservative. They tend to dress conservatively. They tend to be more formal in their work relationships. And they tend to be more formal oftentimes in their clothing. They tend to dress more dressy. Their key values include they follow the rules. They um, value law and order. They value honor, discipline, and they value loyalty. I think it's important that we understand this generation, for the most part in the workplace, made the rules and they followed them. Let me give you an example. Think about the dress code for many organizations today. We see a professional attire. You wear a suit mm -hmm. to work. It's considered to be professional. Well, oftentimes organizations have relaxed that, so they now have a casual Friday. But I'm finding when I'm in organizations that sometimes traditionalists are not comfortable with that, and so you'll find that they're still dressing up on casual Friday. 
This generation, as I mentioned, follow the rules, and oftentimes they get frustrated when other people do not follow the rules. They read handbooks. In fact, they can sometimes quote from them. This generation values loyalty. They went to work for an organization basically forever. They work there until they either were asked to leave or until they retired. They value loyalty in themselves and they value loyalty in others. In addition, this generation tends to be fiscally conservative. We see that in the way that they spend money. They oftentimes spend cash. They don't use credit cards a lot. And their mentality is, if you can't afford it, then you don't buy it. And we see that we, there's a, a link to the way they act in the workplace because of that. They oftentimes will follow, but well, they always follow budgets, but they like to stay within budgets, and they pride themselves that they have money left over at the end of the year in that budget. Interesting. Let's switch gears here and talk about the baby boomers. Mm -hmm. um, and I actually met with some baby boomers and asked them what events were shaping their world during the decade in which they turned 10. So let's take a look at some of the things they had to say about the historical events in their uh, younger years. The escalation of the Vietnam War, uh, my brother getting injured in that war. The GI Bill the creation of the suburbs, and uh, my family was a part of that movement. I remember Watergate. Uh, I remember it interrupting my television programming. <laughs> I would say just after I turned 10 uh, was obviously the assassination of the president, President Kennedy. In the decade that I turned 10, I remember that Elvis died. So we mostly heard some serious historical events going on in the 60s and 70s. Uh, Patty, can you uh, talk to us a little bit more about what influenced the older and the younger boomers? Well, those who were growing up in the 60s, the 60s had a powerful impact on them. And this today is the, those boomers who are now in their 50s. Okay. The boomers who are now in their, um, their 40s were impacted more by what was going on in the 70s. And as we heard also, there was a migration to suburbia. So people were now leaving the extended family and moving to the nuclear family. And with that, again, for the most part, when you look at the family structure, there was a working dad and a stay-at-home mom. Mm -hmm. And that's similar to the traditionalists with the working dad and the stay-at-home mom. That's, that's right. But unlike the traditionalists, boomers grew up watching TV. Boomers grew up watching TV. In addition to the wonderful world of Disney that we heard earlier, boomers grew up watching and this is prime time, things like I Love Lucy, Father Knows Best, The Gomer Pyle Show, The Andy Griffith Show, Gunsmoke, and Bonanza. Interesting. And you mentioned also that traditionalists are fiscally conservative. Yes. Does that hold true for baby boomers as well? Boomers tend to live beyond their means. Yeah. In fact, boomers love credit. The markings of a boomer include designer fashions, whatever's trendy, and high status purchases. Boomers have an inner pride about who they are, and they tend to display that inner pride with external things. And it's interesting, too, that, that boomers tend to feel less guilty in the workplace when they spend the organization's money. <laughs> what, uh, what do boomers tend to value, and how does that play out at work? Boomers value work, success, involvement, team, and lifelong learning. Boomers tend to focus on career, and it's an individual focus. They value having a job. They are competitive in the, work, in the workforce, and um, they also value teamwork. I think it's interesting that this is the generation that was the first generation to be graded on, works well with others, and shares materials with classmates in the work world. And they, they've carried that over in the work world. Another point, and this is a little different, um, another different point is that this generation is becoming sandwiched between their children and their parents. Mm -hmm. They um, are having to make decisions sometimes for children and they're having to make decisions sometimes for age aging parents. So they're kind of trapped in the middle and sometimes they need flexibility in the workplace too. You mentioned success and I wonder if you could help us understand how a baby boomer might define success. A baby boomer typically defines success, success as climbing the corporate ladder, achieving another title, a promotion. So when you think about success for a boomer, it's about moving up. Okay. You know, it's interesting. We've talked, and you know I'm a, a Gen Xer from Generation X, and 
I got to tell you, that definition of success really doesn't resonate with me. Um, and I'm wondering from your research, how, you know, would you think, would you say that other Gen Xers would agree with me or would they not agree with me? I think other genera generation Xers would agree with you. They, this generation defines the success by adding value, by displaying competence, and by adding, mean, adding meaning to the organization. But not necessarily by climbing the ladder. Not necessarily okay. about climbing. It's a, more about achieving results than it is about climbing a ladder. Okay. Now that sounds about right. <laughs> Would you share with us some of the historical events that helped shape Generation X? Well, for the most part, the 80s were the formative years for the, the Xers. Uh, President Reagan was shot. The Challenger explosion was part of this. Um, and we heard that earlier. We heard that earlier, yeah. that it shaped them. The Tiananmen Square uprising, as well as the fall of the Berlin Wall, right. those things helped shape this generation. Now, if you look at an older Xer, um, things that shaped them were things that were going on during the 70s, such as the um, Nixon resignation, mm -hmm. the energy crisis that caused long gas lines, and you bought gasoline by the, the digit that was in your license tag. Right. And also, they were impacted by the Iran hostage crisis. But there's another impact that's huge, and that is massive corporate downsizings. Mm -hmm. Members of this generation saw their working parents be loyal to an organization, and then one day they were told, you're not needed anymore. They were downsized. And that has impacted this generation's sense of loyalty to an organization. Can you tell us a little bit about the values and characteristics of this generation, Generation X? Generation X um, is impacted by divorce. Forty percent of them are from divorced families. And they also had working parents. So when um, they came home from school, they were latchkey kids. In fact, this is the first generation to be strong latchkey kids. Okay, significant numbers of latchkey kids. They came in off the school bus, they got a snack, maybe did a little homework, and then they watched TV. By the time an Xer reached the age of 18, they had watched the equivalent of three years of their waking lives in television. And remember, wow. they're watching this alone, and the programming changes. The subject material is different than what boomers and traditionalists were watching. Right. Three years, that's amazing. So one-sixth of their childhood was spent, well, my childhood was spent watching TV. That's right. Wow. Well, I had a chance to talk to some fellow Xers in the courts, and I asked them what they were watching during some of the, the time they were watching television. Here's what they said. Sesame Street, um, Mr. Rogers, Three's Company, Love Boat. I used to watch The Cosby Show and The Three Stooges. I liked Growing Pains and Cosby Show, um, Family Ties. Those were probably my favorites. Of course, I enjoyed uh, Lancelot, Link, Secret Chimp. The Smurfs, Care Bears, uh, The Simpsons. The Cosby Show, Good Times, and Sesame Street. Now, I remember watching many of those shows myself. In fact, it was a really big deal to stay up late on a Friday night and watch Dallas, and I remember Love Boat being on on Saturday nights. Now, Patty, I'm wondering what, the, uh, what you would say about the, the programming that we watched as Xers. Well, for Xers, the programming tended to focus more on one's individuality more than, and more than it did on the, on the family structure. So it's more about the individual and less about the family structure. Also, the programming had working women shown, and there was more diversity displayed in this programming, too. And that, those two factors also have helped to shape the view of the world that Xers have. And earlier you talked about the family structure. I'm wondering if you could go in a little more specifically about the values and characteristics of Gen X. Generation X tends to value balance, fun, diversity, informality, and they focus on results mm -hmm. at work. They tend to wear more casual, functional clothing, and they oftentimes have what I call body art, piercings and tattoos. Now, now for a generation that's before them, the traditionalists and the boomers, they struggle with that. In right. fact, sometimes boomers can be judgmental, and this body art causes them to raise an eyebrow. I mean, think about when I was a kid, the only man who I'd ever seen with an earring was Mr. Clean. <laughs> <laughs> well, so we know how to spot an Xer, or we kind of know how to spot an Xer. How would you spot a millennial? Well, the markings of a, of a millennial include cell phones, retro clothing, and brand name clothing. Mm -hmm. 
by the time a millennial reached the age of nine, they were considered to be brand washed. They only want to wear certain clothes that have the right label, the right label in the by back. By nine years old. By nine years old. They are drawn to objects and clothes that say expensive. And an interesting survey, recent survey tells us that the average 18 year old in this country receives $125 a month allowance. So this generation is not used to waiting for what it wants, whether that's in their personal life or whether that's in their work life. Wow, that's a good amount of disposable income. Absolutely. <laughs> what else has, has shaped their values? One third of this generation are born to single mothers. Wow. And those who are living with two parents, for the most part, are living with two parents who are working. So the family structure has changed dramatically or significantly for this generation. Now for the millennials working in the courts right now, their formative decade would have been the 90s, right? That's right, the 90s. So let's take a look at some of the things that were going on in the 90s that helped to shape them. Um, there was the, the first Gulf War, the O.J. Simpson trial, the Oklahoma City bombing, uh, the Clinton Lewinsky scandal, right. numerous schoolyard shootings including Columbine, Election 2000, and of course, the terrorist attacks on September the 11th, 2001. These things have significantly impacted the way this generation sees the world. So we're all, we were all affected by those things, but you're saying that they were particularly affected by Absolutely. Them. Okay. Well, I think it's, it would almost be impossible to talk about this generation without talking about technology. I mean, it was so prevalent during their formative years. And some court staff actually weighed in on this issue and how technology and millennials almost go hand in hand. So let's hear what they had to say. Technology is changing rapidly and that is the first major obstacle to, especially to like the baby boomers and older generations. First and foremost is the natural talent and facility they bring with their automation skills. What takes me three months to master, they can do in one week. We're not afraid of and in fact embrace uh, new technological advances in the workplace. They understand the computer. They grew up with the computer. Uh, you know, working with five, six different programs open at the same time, they have no problem doing that. You know, I have always considered myself technically savvy, but I'll tell you that some of the younger folks in the office, they put me to shame. Uh, you know, Patty, it seems like the millennials are uh, especially technically savvy bunch. Well, like Xers, millennials certainly are techno-literate. They use communication tools as email, and they've grown up with the Internet. They use instant messaging. They use text messaging. Um, they have never known a world without, for many of them, the internet or, or right. cell phones or email. And they've also been inundated with technology for entertainment. They grew up playing with an electronic gadget or playing with a video game. And that's different than the way boomers and traditionalists grew up. It's also interesting to note that the television program, programming has actually changed, not only the subject mater material, but the programming is much faster paced today than it was 20 or 30 years ago. And let's think about what was this generation watching during prime time. They were watching things such as The X-Files, Friends, Frasier, ER, The Simpsons, Seinfeld, and of course, reality TV. Very different. It's interesting too that this generation, I think, has competing media. They have the internet, they have iPods, they have CDs, and what blows my mind is that they can use them all at the same time. <laughs> well, now we know a little bit about what influenced them, what do they value? What do millennials tend to value? Millennials tend to value civic duty, street smarts, their um, achievement, diversity, and money. They have a strong self-image. They are confident in who they are, and they are confident about the skill set that they bring to the workplace. They thrive on innovation, on innovation, and they thrive on making money. Actually, another survey tells us, recent survey taken of college graduates, and they cite economic benefit as the major reason for attending college. Interesting. This generation also is oblivious to gender and race. As I mentioned, they value diversity. Some call this generation colorblind. Some say that this generation is more open-minded than any other generation yet, and they do not have preconceived ideas about what men 
and what men, sh what men and women should do in the workplace. They do not have preconceived ideas about the roles that they should play. Interesting. Well, we've talked a lot about each of these four generations, and I'd like to give everyone a chance to think about this from a personal perspective, since we're all members of a generation. So at your site, uh, take a few minutes to answer the question, which generation do you identify with? And maybe it's one particular generation, or maybe you're like Patty, and you, uh, you maybe you identify with more than one generation. But t think about it for yourself, and then share with a partner. So we'll be back in a few minutes.
Welcome back, and thanks for sharing your generational story with a colleague. Patty and I were talking during the break as well, and uh, I was sharing with her that I definitely feel like I'm a Gen Xer. I, I really, really um, feel that the values of a Gen Xer, that's, that's what I embody, the uh, value of balance, fun, and flexibility. So that's a little bit about my story. And now that we have a sense of what generation we fit in, we want to talk about generational characteristics and how they can be assets or liabilities at work in the courts. So we're first going to look at the two youngest generations, the 40% of the court family that is either a Gen Xer or millennial. And we're going to look at, again, assets and liabilities. And we're first going to hear in this next clip from some of their older colleagues, the boomers and traditionalists. And then we'll also hear from some Xers and millennials themselves. So let's take a look. I think at work that the generational differences are most pronounced in the way that people approach whatever the task is. Someone my age is a little more careful and doesn't rush right in, where someone who's younger, they're right there, ready to go. For the younger generation, I think it's um, easy solutions. They uh, tend to uh, try to s solve an issue uh, too quickly with an easy solution, and, and really it's more complex than that. I really admire Gen X's sense of risk-taking. I think it's an invaluable quality in today's world that they are looking forward, they are not afraid to take chances and make a mistake, and they're willing to learn from their mistakes and move on. Well, perhaps with some of the Gen Xers, there is a bit of a sense of entitlement. Um, I think that at times they expect to move up through the ranks faster than some of us baby boomers have. They find new ways of doing the job. Uh, I think their strength is that they question the status quo. The younger generations, they're so fast, they're so quick. I tend to want to speed things up a little bit. Um, get through things as quickly as, as humanly possible. I'm a Gen Xer and I definitely like to have fun at work. Well, I love having flexibility. Um, our bosses are flexible. Um, we have flexible hours. That means a lot. People of my generation find it important to uh, be more fast-paced and efficient. And so I think um, the whole advancement of technologies and everything have added to that. Well, there's definitely some honest feedback there about Xers and Millennials. And Patty, I'm wondering if you would uh, talk a little bit about this tendency towards speed and risk taking. It sounded to me like it can be almost an asset or a liability at work. And, and if you could talk a little bit about you know, the, what the younger generations value. Well, I think from what I've seen, the Xers and the millennials tend to get a stereotype of being a slacker. Right. And I think they've gotten a bad rap, quite honestly. I think what we're seeing is that they are motivated by different things than our boomers right. and traditionalists. For example, millennials tend to be motivated by technology, opportunity, money, and training. Okay. Xers tend to be motivated by state-of-the-art technology and a fun, relaxed, flexible work environment. This generation does not neither of these generations do not choose to live to work right. and other generations have really focused more on career. Okay. Well, I actually asked some uh, court staff off camera what their, some older court staff, the boomers and traditionalists, their opinions of Gen Xers and millennials to, to tell me a little bit about the assets and liabilities. So let's take a look at those. Uh, some of the assets include flexibility, adaptability, fearlessness and uh, a tendency to be more relaxed and open-minded, even carefree, energetic, that word came up a lot, bold, innovative, and as we've said, technically savvy. We heard this earlier, unafraid to challenge the status quo, and because they're newer in the workplace, a source of fresh perspectives. On the other hand, also heard some liabilities, that they can be Xers and millennials, immature, they can be procrastinators, they can be a little bit unreliable, and they tend to not admire much of anything. They're a little bit self-centered on occasion and lack discipline and personal skills. At work, they may be less apt to stay late and more apt to question everything. So, Patty, would you comment first talking about the millennials? Well, 
When you look at the generation as a whole, the assets for millennials typically include they are great multitaskers. They are positive and optimistic, and as we've heard, they are technologically savvy. In fact, this is the first time in history that we have a generation that is considered to be an authority on a subject that their parents are not, and that subject, of course, is technology. They do have liabilities. Because of their age, they tend to need structure and supervision. Because of their age, they're inexperienced, and they're inexperienced specifically with handling people issues. Right. What about Xers? Xers also are techno-literate. Their assets also include that they are creative, they are adaptable, and, and they um, are independent. And I think these things come from the fact that they were latchkey kids. They had responsibility early, mm -hmm. they were independent early, and that has tied into shaping who they are. They do have liabilities. This generation tends to be cynical, they tend to be impatient, they tend to sometimes have poor people skills. And another interesting thing is that this generation has been inundated with news, and sadly, almost nothing knocks them cold. In fact, they invented the phrase, been there, done that. Can you share with us any similarities, other similarities, between the Xers, Gen Xers, and Millennials? Both generations embrace change, and they flow with it. Change is not a stressor for them. It's not anything new, so they like change. They are unimpressed with, and they sometimes are unintimidated with authority. They will oftentimes challenge an older colleague in the workplace openly. They tend to have a leadership style that's equalitarian. It's about being inclusive and about being fair. When they are led, they want to have honest, frequent feedback. Okay. They want to feel like that they're adding value to the organization. They want to feel like that whatever they're working on is meaningful and adding meaning to the organization. And they are demotivated when they are micromanaged. They want a real hands-off management style when it's managing them. Okay. The focus here for them tends to be on results. It's about what's achieved and what's accomplished, not about how many hours did you work today or how many hours did you put on that project. Okay. It's about the results that are achieved. And I think it's interesting, too, we know that they're motivated by different things. There was a recent survey taken, asked boomers and Xers, given the choice, what would you want? An office in the corner with adored windows or state-of-the-art technology? And the boomer said, give me the office in the corner. Mm -hmm. and, the, and the Xers said, I prefer the state-of-the-art technology. Well, let's talk about the boomers and the traditionalists. It's only fair to, to turn the tables a little bit. And uh, we had some Xers and millennials actually talk about their boomer and traditionalist colleagues. So let's hear what they had to say. I n admire their knowledge base, and I also um, admire their, the paths that they have paved for uh, us future generations. Their experience, uh, their patience, and understanding and willingness to share that. Some of them have a tendency to view their ideas and their ways of doing things as perfect. The older generations, they tend to not trust us younger generations as much, think that maybe we don't know enough to do our jobs. It's the change thing. We have a lot going on in our office right now, for example, that's changing and um, you see a lot of the older people resisting that and not willing to really move forward with everybody else. Well, before I ask Patty to comment on that, I'd like to share with you some other thoughts from court staff we didn't get on camera. Again, talking about traditionalists and boomers and their assets and liabilities. And this is coming from, of course, the millennials and the Gen Xers. They say that the older generations tend to be dependable, dedicated, and experienced. As Patty mentioned, the word loyal came up often. They're committed to work and hardworking. They tend to be structured and honest, even courageous. They're very respectful of others, and they also tend to be very knowledgeable. On the flip side, liabilities include being a little bit less adaptable and flexible, even to the point of rigidity. They can be prone to go it alone or do it themselves. Serious, again, resistant to change, we've heard earlier, and a bit conservative. You know, Patty, it's clear that with age and experience comes wisdom. You've heard that expression, but is there more to it than that? There is. First of all, these generations have a wealth of experience and have a wealth of skills. They have a historical perspective on the organization. They tend to be dedicated, hardworking, and sometimes even driven in their work ethic. 
I oftentimes will hear a boomer say, I, I'm sorry, oftentimes we hear a traditionalist say, if, it's worth, if a job is worth doing, then it's worth doing right. They take pride in the fact that they have a job and they take pride in the product of their job. It's also interesting to point out that boomers tend to have a strong self-identity with their work. My experience has been if you ask a boomer who are you, they will respond with their job title. Interesting. Can you tell us a little bit more about the assets that each generation, the traditionalists and the, and the boomers bring to the workplace? Traditionalists tend to be detail-oriented, thorough, and even-tempered. They also have a stick-it-out mentality. They just stick with it. They have a respectful view of authority also. And let's not forget their imaginations. Remember, we talked about that earlier, and I think they developed strong imaginations as children, and they still have those imaginations that we sometimes forget to tap into right. today. Boomers, on the other hand, are team players. They have, they're good, they have strong people skills, they are good rapport builders, and they have a very strong customer service orientation. Their focus is about putting the customer first. And from an authority perspective, boomers tend to have a love-hate authority, uh, a love-hate view of authority. They love authority when authority is on their side. They hate authority when authority is against them. Well, speaking of authority, you know, most of the court leaders and managers are from the baby boomer and traditionalist generations. So would you share with us how they tend to be as leaders and also what motivates them? as workers? Traditionalists tend to have a command and control leadership style. They tend to make the bulk of decisions themselves. They have a take charge mentality. They are not afraid of making a decision or of being in charge. They are motivated by stability and security and that makes sense when you think back. Many of them grew up after the Great Depression, those years that followed that. They are also motivated with the work itself. Having a job is a motivating factor for them. And they tend to be motivated by a sincere appreciation for the work that they've done. They like handwritten notes, for example. So if you want to show appreciation to a traditionalist, to be motivating, you need to handwrite them a note instead of sending them an email, right. a typed email. Boomers lead with the consensus method. They oftentimes will put a team together to tackle a project. But it's important to understand here, too, that boomers have a hierarchy oftentimes in these teams, and at the top is where they are, and so they will make the decision if they need to. Right. What they're motivated by tends to be respect, success, visible perks, and climbing the organizational ladder. That's important to a boomer. Okay. What about how they tend to work with others? You mentioned a little bit about that, but can you expand on that a bit? Well, traditionalists are formal, and boomers are formal but not as formal in the workplace. Both generations tend to use um, voicemail and telephones more than they use email. Okay. Both generations follow the rules, they read procedural handbooks, they go by them. And both generations tend to assign and assess work with a meeting. So they need, they have this something inside of them, let's get everybody together and let's talk about what's going on in your area and, right. and how can we work on it. But they do this in a meeting setting. Boomers also are overachievers and oftentimes they expect everyone else to be an overachiever too. We talked a lot about assets earlier about these two generations, but can you talk a little bit more about the liabilities for traditionalists and boomers? Traditionalists tend to resist change. They like the status quo. They're comfortable with it. Um, in fact, they, they will say, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. Um, they also sometimes are apprehensive of technology. They, I have seen, in, in my experience, an organization implement a new automation system. And a traditionalist really struggle with that and say, you know what? I can retire and maybe this is the time to do that instead of having to learn this new automation system. So they tend to resist change, they tend to have um, be apprehensive with technology, mm -hmm. and oftentimes they won't buck the system. Okay. It depends on how you look at it, whether that's an asset or a liability, but oftentimes it's, it's a liability. They just kind of are, are very conforming. They will not openly challenge a member that's a, a person who's in authority. They may talk one-on-one, -on -one, but they're not going to openly challenge right. that person. Boomers, on the other hand, tend to be change masters. Okay. 
Boomers are not satisfied unless they can constantly improve the process. So for a boomer, it's about changing to improve. Let's change this to improve it. Right. Sometimes boomers change to make a mark, but oftentimes they're just interested in, in changing that whole process. I have found, however, that this can drive people crazy. <laughs> they're always changing. It even drives other boomers crazy who like change. But let's change this and let's change that can, can really um, drive someone crazy. They also tend to be self-centered. They tend to be um, judgmental. And they can be overly sensitive to feedback. They like feedback, but if it's negative, they can be overly sensitive to that. Which is a direct contrast to the Xers and Millennials who said really want feedback. And they want honest feedback. Right. It is a difference. Hmm. All right, well, you've given us a lot of information, a lot to chew on with all these generations. I'm wondering if you can summarize for us a little bit about each generation so we, before we move on. Yes, I certainly can. Um, let's start with the Millennials. Um, the Millennials are new to the workplace. They're just beginning to come into the workplace. They respond well to innovation and change. They thrive on innovation. They want to add value and receive feedback, and they want feedback from their peers as well as from their managers. They enjoy using technology. Remember, this is the first time in history that they're an authority on a topic that their parents aren't. They seek learning and growth opportunities. In other words, they value training and they see the organization as being responsible for keeping their skill set current. Generation Xers are similar in some ways. They enjoy being challenged. They seek challenge and responsibilities and they oftentimes are known as risk takers. They are unimpressed with authority. They, um, interesting, are the first to be graded on ability to challenge others' thinking when they were in elementary school, and they have taken that to the workplace. They seek balance and flexibility. They do not choose to live to work. Also, they focus on results, not on time. It's about accomplishments, not about the time involved. And they seek learning opportunities. In other words, they value training also. Baby boomers are driven to succeed. They have a self-identity linked to their work. Um, they value success, involvement, and team. They are masters of change. They constantly are seeking improvement. They led the way of people, the, the wave of people back to graduate school. They use meetings to discuss and assign work. And they have a customer service orientation. And that orientation is about putting the customer first. Traditionalist work hard and take pride in their work. They are, in fact, thankful to have a job. They respect authority. They grew up showing respect by saying things such as yes, ma'am, and no, sir. They follow rules. They're frustrated when others don't follow the rules. They are formal in their dress and mannerisms. They tend to be conservative, and they tend to call people by their last names in the workplace until they're given permission not to do so. And lastly, they focus on the time spent working. They focus on the number of hours worked in a day or on a project. Thanks, Patty. It's a, a lot to take in. And I want to give everyone viewing a chance to revisit your earlier answer to the question I asked, which was, what generation do you feel you identify with? Now that you've got some more data, you may find that your answer changes. So take a few minutes, you can do this with a partner, to think about do you still agree with your earlier answer? Do you still feel that you identify with that generation? So take a few minutes and we'll come back to talk about it.
Welcome back. So how many of you changed your answer? I bet at least a few of you did. When we talked earlier, and Patty, you mentioned that you straddle generations or transcend generations. So how normal is it for someone to not necessarily have a hard and fast answer to the question of which generation they identify with? I think it's normal. Remember, we are again talking about averages and trends. We are all unique, and the generational component is just one factor that really helps define us. Well, let's switch gears here. I want to talk about how we can work more effectively in the courts with generations other than our own. So would you talk about that a little bit? Well, I think there's some strategies that we can use to help us to be more effective. Now, the key is we're not talking about changing who we are. We're talking about changing how we relate to people or how we work with people. But we're going to stay who we are and use some strategies to help us. Okay. Well, let's first talk about the majority of the court family. And we mentioned earlier that baby boomers are 51% of all judiciary employees. But if you add that number to the percentage of Xers, you come up with 89% are either Xers or boomers. So let's talk about those groups first, since most of us are going to be working with either an Xer or a boomer or both. Right. So let's talk about boomers first. What are some strategies to work more effectively with them? Well, I think one of the most important strategies is to show respect to a boomer. Remember, boomers tend to be idealistic and workaholics. Many of them take pride in their job title. Right. So respect the fact that they have seniority, that they have experience, and respect the contributions that they've made to the organization. Okay. Another strategy is to publicly thank them. Boomers are motivated by public recognition. So you can do this whether it's sending them an email and forwarding that email on to um, colleagues that are on up the chain of command. Maybe you put their name in a newsletter or maybe you post their name in a, on a bulletin board, whether it's one that's in the hallway or whether it's an electronic one. So a boomer you'd want to publicly thank, but a traditionalist you might want to write a personal note to. Exactly. Okay. So there's a little difference. Okay. Another strategy for a boomer includes that we need to understand their need for meetings. This is the way that they grew up with work. This is the way they grew up assigning and assessing work. They are comfortable with this. Okay. Now, the key is for boomers to make sure that these meetings are productive. Right. And if Xers and Millennials, who tend not to like a lot of meetings, are really struggling with the meetings, and sometimes other boomers struggle with a lot of meetings too, then I think it's important that they speak up and see if there's another communication tool that they can use. But do understand that boomers really have something inside of them that drives them. They need to have a meeting. And lastly, provide flexibility for them. The reason I say that is, remember, we talked about that they're becoming sandwiched between their children and their aging parents. Right. And many, many times they need flexibility to, to, maybe it's to attend a ball game of a child and maybe it's to take care of a, of a need for uh, a parent. They need flexibility. Cut them some slack, understand that need, and help them not to feel so guilty about needing that flexibility. And you could do that whether you are the person in charge of the boomer or whether you're just a peer. Right? Absolutely. You can do it with the peers or management. It okay. goes both ways. All right. Well, let's talk about the Xers now. Uh, we talked about the boomers. What about some strategies for working more effectively with Gen Xers? Well, remember, Xers tend to focus on results more than they focus on the time committed. Right. So the strategy here is to focus on results. Another strategy is to provide a fun, flexible, relaxed work environment. We've heard that. Right. That's what they want. They want relaxed rules. They want more autonomy. And I have found in my experience that if they don't find that they're working in a fun, flexible environment, they will either leave physically or, worse yet, they will stay and check out mentally. Okay. Another strategy is to explain the reasons for the rules. Some, some rules cannot be changed. Some rules cannot be relaxed. But it helps if an Xer understands the reason behind the rule. Right. If the reason is reasonable and fair, usually an Xer will buy into it. So explain the rules. Okay. And the last strategy is to nourish their creative spirit and their love of technology. Understand this generation tends to want to think outside of the box. They want to do work in a different way. Right. So let's allow them to do that and actually nourish and nurture that creative spirit. And that's better for the organization anyway. Absolutely. Okay. So now we've got 89% of the court family taken care of. We want to look at that other 11%. So let's start with the traditionalists. What 
how can we work more effectively with them? What are some strategies to work better with the traditionalist colleagues? Well, I think, again, one of the important things that we need to do is to show them respect. Remember, most traditionalists went to work for an organization and have stayed there, so they have a lot of experience, they have a lot of seniority. And that's the case in the courts. Many people that I've worked with have been, have kind of grown up in the courts. Exactly. So what we want to do is to ask for their input and ask for their opinions. That's giving them respect. Understand that they have a valuable historical perspective, so let's try to tap into that. Secondly, involve them in change initiatives. Remember, for some of them, change causes them stress. So let's help them with that. Maybe it's that we tell them the, how, the hows and the whys. Why does this need to change? How is it going to change? And also, you may want to even add some staggered implementation dates. Instead of saying, okay, this is going to change tomorrow, or this is going to change next week, let's have a staggered process to help them ease through that change. Third, use them as mentors. This generation, as I said, has a lot of history and a lot of information. So let's let them share that. We sure don't want to lose that organizational history. So share that with members of other generation. Use them as mentors. And lastly, provide technological buddies or coaches uh, for them so that they have a comfortable environment where they can um, help them ease that apprehension of technology so there's someone they can ask their questions to and it's a safe environment when they can do that. And it's almost a retention strategy for traditionalists in a way. It certainly can be a tr retention strategy for traditionalists, yes. Well, I know right now there's only 2% of court employees are millennials, but that number, as we know, is only going to increase. So let's talk about how to effectively work with that, with that generation. Well, I think using mental relationships is a big one. We've talked about that with um, traditionalists, but you can right. also do that with millennials. What we want to do is pair them with a, bo a boomer or with a traditionalist, right. someone who understands the organization, someone who they can ask questions to. Secondly, expose them to opportunities. This generation wants to be exposed. They, they value opportunities. Right. So help them to get a broad perspective of the organization. Third, provide honest, frequent feedback. This goes for peers as well as management. Okay. This generation wants to know how they're doing, and they want to know more than one time a year. Right. So they say, tell me, what am I doing well, and where do I need to improve? Mm -hmm. And lastly, provide them with ongoing training. We have learned that for this generation, training is something that is a motivating factor for them. Mm -hmm. In fact, this generation believes that it's the organization's responsibility to keep their skill set current and they are looking for organizations that have strong training programs and I have found that they are actually staying with organizations that have that and some people say well Patty when you provide a strong training program aren't you just training them for their next job right yes but we hope that job's going to be within your organization right. because we're seeing that it can actually be a retention strategy too Great. to help them stay well, thanks for providing those strategies. You know, it, it's interesting to note when these um, problems with generations come up. And so I actually asked some court staff when they find tension around generational issues. In other words, when it seems like the things we've talked about today become a barrier to productivity. I wanted to share with you some of the things they said. One is when organizational changes take place. Another is when there's changes in work duties or promotions. Interactions with the public and customer service can often cause a generational rub. And the next one we've talked about a lot, technology. Respect, this whole issue of respect and coworker relationships tends to be an area of potential friction. And perceptions of work ethic, and the big one, schedule, work hours, and leave. Dress codes is something we've alluded to, but it also came up when we talked to court staff. So, Patty, would you say these are typical? These are typical in the workplace. Most tension and stress in the workplace revolves around change, technology, policies and procedures, and working relationships. Now, sometimes that's because of misperceptions, miscommunication, and even, even organizational culture. However, I have found that sometimes this is because of true generational differences. Right. People just see things differently. And let me give you an example, the dress code. We understand that in many organizations the dress code is formal. It's professional, you wear a suit. 
and members of the younger generations are saying, what's the big deal about, right. why can't I dress down, why right. do I have to dress up? However, boomers and traditionalists see this issue as a sign of respect. Right. So we have two totally different perspectives on the same issue. Right. So how, how do you resolve something like this? Well, if it's established, if it's a rule and it's established, then by all means we want to follow that. Right. Absolutely. Um, it's important that we follow that. However, it's important also for boomers and traditionalists to let the younger members know why is it important. Right. Tell them why this is significant. Why is it that we need to wear a suit? I know that, for example, probably you need to wear a suit in the courtroom. Right. I understand that. It's a sign of respect. Absolutely. We'll share the whys with members of this right. younger generation. And then they may say, yeah, okay, I get it in the courtroom, but how about in the office? Well, maybe then they can suggest in the office, can we dress a different way? Keeping a suit in hand in case I'm called unexpectedly right. into the court, then I will have it. But again, this is kind of a give and take right. on both ends. So it's, it's both sides understanding where the other one is coming from. That's exactly right. Okay. Well, let's give you a chance to think about at least one of these issues for your court unit. And if you happen to be with others at your site, I'd like you to get a dialogue going about one of the issues. You'll have the list in your participant guide. Talk about where the issue seems to be most, uh, I guess, uh, difficult for your group. And talk about how you can use the strategies we've discussed to get beyond the generational differences. So we'll give you a few minutes and then we'll come back.
Welcome back. I hope you had enough time and enjoyed the time you had talking about one of these issues from a generational perspective. And we actually just got a fax from one of our colleagues out in the Tenth Circuit. So I won't name you by name, but I do want to have Patty answer this question for us all. The question is, you said that you should recognize traditionalists with a personal note mm -hmm. and recognize baby boomers publicly. Right. How do you recognize Xers and millennials? Well, Xers and millennials tend to focus more on the individuals. So what you would do is you could just verbally thank them or you could do an email thank you to them too because they like that, but make it an individual kind of a thing. If it's a significant reward that you're trying to, to thank or whatever and you're in a management role, the way to really show them that you are thankful and appreciative is to, show, to give them some time off. Um, remember, they value balance in their lives right. and they are motivated by time off. Okay. So even letting them leave early a little bit? Letting them leave early okay. would be a motivating if it's factor a big, If it's a big thing. If it's a big thing, yes. Okay. Right, well, I'm going to ask you a question that one of my colleagues raised with me, uh, and that is, do generations carry their values and characteristics with them as they age, or as they age, do they tend to have different values and characteristics? Research tells us that for the most part, our values are our values. Therefore, my values today are going to be the values that I continue carrying on. However, there is a PS. Um, when you look at millennials, and I think about some of the things that they um, are motivated by, money for example. You know, when I was 18 or 20 years old, I wanted money too. Money was certainly a motivating thing, and I do think we're going to see that that changes. Also, liabilities for a millennial, because they're young, tends to be that they're inexperienced, they need um, structure and supervision. That will change also as they learn and as they grow and as they mature. But for the most part, remember, all kinds of things shape those value systems, and those are, that's the core of who we are, and that's not going to change dramatically as we age. Okay. One more question for you. I'm wondering, as you go to other organizations, if you're finding that organizational leaders are really receptive to the whole notion of generational differences being um, one thing that is a, can be a barrier to productivity. Is that something you're seeing? I am seeing that they find that, but I also under, I'm seeing that organizations who truly embrace the fact that there are some differences here, and let's try to work with those differences right. and make it a better working place, those are the organizations, in my opinion, that are going to be successful. So our court leaders should be taking this into consideration. I sure hope they are. <laughs> Great. Well, you know, one of the things that I've noticed throughout this program is kind of an underlying thread through everything is this whole notion of respect. Mm -hmm. It seems to be a, a, a continuing theme. And so I actually asked some court staff about how they want to be respected at work. So here's what they said. I would like my coworkers to show respect for me by being polite and not ignoring me because of my age. I want to be respected just as they are respected, even though they are older and they have more knowledge and wisdom, I too have knowledge to bring to the job. I'm often parented rather than managed, and I feel that sometimes I'm spoon fed more information because of, I am young. I would like my coworkers to give me the courtesy to hear what I say, to keep their word to me, and just to treat me as another colleague. Trusting me, trusting in my abilities, and you know, maybe giving me more opportunities than what would be normal for my position. A lot of times they shut you down because you're younger and because you, um, you don't have as much experience. They think maybe your ideas aren't as good. But I think it would be helpful to listen before you make a judgment. Just listen, hear me out, hear my ideas through, you know, thoroughly before you go ahead and think that it won't work. Uh, Treat me as an individual, a grown adult. You know, what I heard were a few things were trust, honesty, and listening. Patty, why is respect so important? Well, I think no matter how we define respect, we all want it. And we want to add value to an organization. We want our work to be respected. And I think when we show respect to someone, we're actually validating them as a person. So the goal here is to get the job done respect one another, but be sensitive to the generational differences as well. Okay. Well, we're just about ready to wrap up, and I wonder if you have any last final comments for us. Well, I, I just want to make sure that we all understand that our values are shaped 
by the historical events and different influences that we've had growing up. Right. They're going to be different. Mm -hmm. I think it's important for, for the courts to grasp, again, to be successful, the differences in the assets and the liabilities in each of the generations and to really understand those. I think it's important for the courts to employ members of all generations because there's a strength there. You can have a diversified strength by having right. these different perspectives. When you're putting together, for example, a committee or a task force, make sure that you're putting together a committee or task force that represent all different generations. Again, to bring those different strengths into the workplace. Right. And you don't want one, just one generation represented because then you have all their liabilities there too. Right. So the goal here is to enable the courts to understand that we are unique and to tap into that and use it as a strength. Great. Well, thank you, Patty. You've been just a wonderful resource for us today. Okay, well, that's about it for us. I want to thank the Tenth Circuit for sending in a question, my colleague who shall remain nameless for sending a question, and thank all of you for participating in today's program. We really would appreciate your feedback, and so if you could fax us your evaluation, the fax number is 202. 502-4088. Thanks so much, and until next time, take care.